Hello everyone and welcome to our today's webinar on Mount Allison University MSM Agent E Summit 2020 live. Our attendees are in process of joining the webinar. In the meanwhile on the behalf of MSM and Mount Allison I hope you all are safe. Good evening ladies and gentlemen from all part of the world. My name is Shivani Sajdeva Canada uh, manager Canada overseeing Canadian Institute at MSM. I am delighted and uh, pleased to introduce our today's presenter Adhiraj Gill manager international recruitment and admission. Before I hand over the mic to him I will quickly run through the Zoom webinar platform with you. As a reminder everyone is currently muted and we encourage you to type all your questions and comments through the presentation in the Q&A section uh, presented in the control panel. Later in the presentation we will have brief moment on Q&A Uh, on which we will uh, encourage you to type all your questions and in case we are unable to answer your question today do not worry our managers will be getting back to you in case of facing any te technical issues please free to drop in your message in the chat box the webinar is recorded and will be posted on our youtube channel afterwards so without further ado let's kick start the things uh, by welcoming the presenter over to you adhiraj Thank you, Shivani. Um, thank you uh, to the entire team at M Square for arranging this round of uh, virtual sessions with all the partners. My name is Adhiraj, and I am the International Recruitment Manager for Mount Allison University. It's a university which is located on the east coast of Canada in a town called Sackville, New Brunswick. I've been in the role for about six months now. I've uh, I recently joined the role in January and I've been in the role for about 6 months. I moved here from Vancouver. I may have met some of you in my previous uh, roles. I was working in India with Navitas uh promoting uh, the Navitas Canada brand. I was also working with Study Group in in uh, South Asia were promoting uh Australia, uh, you know, uh, study uh study centers in Australia at the time. So I've been doing this now for about 3 or 4 years and uh it's uh, it's my first time working for a university uh as opposed to the private sector. So it's I'll start my presentation. Uh it will be for about 40 minutes and then I'll leave it open to any questions that you may have. So Mount Allison This is our campus. Uh we are a 180 year old institution. We were started in about 1839 and we've been around for a very very long time. There's some great accolades that we have. Like for example, we were the first uh university in the entire British Empire to grant a bachelor's degree to a lady. So it was so there's a lot of culture, a lot of history, uh a lot of uh, you know every every building that you walk into you can you can sort of make out how old it is and you know it's uh, there's a lot of culture and there's a lot of history to the institution so all our buildings are very very you know you get a very victorian uh, feel when you enter our buildings there's a lot of hilt a uh, lot of uh, heritage in our buildings and you when you walk around the campus it's one of the most beautiful campuses that i have seen and i've studied in institutions in new zealand i've i've done my masters degree in canada and i wasn't fortunate to do it at mount allison i did it at another university but when you know the six months that i've been here and working here and the the way i see the students interacting with each other there's a very very strong community feel and the students are generally very proud of the institution that they go to now i'll quickly play you a few videos during the course of this webinar so i have two video videos this one talks about uh, just mount allison in general the structure of our degree and so on So I'll first play this one and then I'll move on to the rest of the presentation. What I would highlight about Mount Allison University is the history, the high quality focus on academic programs and the opportunity to learn in a amazing learning environment. So we're really thinking of that student experience from the lab to the community with best technology, high quality art studios, a new and developing library opportunity for the future. That's what makes Mount Allison experiences I think very special. 
but I like the kind of small town, small university feel and the connection that it has with the community. Um, and so when I got to Mount Allison, I found all those things, but I also found a great deal of student engagement and I was very interested in the kind of small class, hands-on, experiential learning. It's all the different learning that I could do outside of the classroom. The general Mount Allison student is, is very involved and is very, um, very busy. <laughs> so I guess I would come prepared to be busy, not just with your classes, but also with the many other things that you'll find that you love to be involved with. Lecturers are actually trying to recruit grad students because our reputation for training prospective grad students is so strong that they know that if they come to give a, a seminar that they'll be able to speak afterwards to prospective students and perhaps recruit some. The nature of, you know, the learning here and the way you can really interact with, you know, your faculty, the way you can interact with, you know, the student body and really, really feel involved. You really want to make sure that the time you have here, you're really engaging in the material that you have and you're fostering those relationships with professors and the community you're in. And for me, you know, being at a school like Monet, that's an opportunity I knew I'd have and, you know, it's, it's not let me down. So I'll start, uh, during the course of this presentation, I'll tell you who's who uh, at the International Center um, in the International Recruitment Division. I'll give you an overview of M Mount Allison University. I'll give you information that would be pertinent to recruiting students. So when you're dealing with students, you, you know, this is the information that you sh should essentially be relaying to them. I'll tell you about the uh, expectations of our partners uh, from our agents in terms of documentation. And I'll then I'll finally, I'll leave it open to questions. So I'm, in, our, in, the, in the admissions office, we have Kutai, who's my boss. He's the director of recruitment, admissions, and awards. Uh, so he takes care of everything pertaining to admissions, the uh, entire, whether it's domestic or international or scholar, you know, even the awards division, which is scholarship. So all of this comes under him. Um, and I report to Kutai. So I take care of international specifically, right? Uh, international recruitment as well as admission. So you'll see me travel, you'll see me uh, at virtual fairs. You may, you know, when the COVID-19, uh, when post COVID, you may see me at some fairs or traveling around my market. So uh, I do, because I do recruitment as well as admission. So likely whenever you send an internet, like a file for admissions, most probably it would be processed by me. So, um, yeah, that's just uh, just a recap on my role. And then we have a domestic team. So that's a bigger team. They have uh, that takes care of domestic. So uh, basically North America. And I take care of anything apart from North America and uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we have Suzette. Suzette is the agent relations and office coordinator. So for example, if you have a question about, uh, you know, an outstanding commission payment or uh, let's say there's some brochures that have been ordered and you haven't received the brochures. So uh, you, she's the person to contact for such things. And our email addresses are mentioned here. So mine is adgill at mta.ca in case you have questions. Sorry, just give me a second. Now we have degrees in arts, science, commerce, music, and fine arts. So that essentially we have BA, BCom, BSc, Bachelor of Music, Bachelor of Fine, Fine Arts. So five degrees, uh, but so five degrees, but 40 different programs. What that means is under these five degrees, you have a lot of different majors and minors that you students can choose. So it's like, for example, you can be doing a Bachelor of Commerce specializing in accounting and, and marketing, let's say two specializations, right? So major, you know, you could be doing two majors. So marketing as well as accounting, or you could be doing marketing as a, um, as a major and a minor from, let's say, another faculty, like you do philosophy from the Faculty of Arts, or you can be doing a major with two different minors from two different faculties, or you can be doing a double major, or you can be doing a double degree, which is five years in duration. So there's a lot of flexibility, five programs, 40 different, uh, 40, five degrees, 40 different programs. So students can sort of create their own program as they go, as they proceed into the degree. So there's a lot of flexibility and, uh, the, you know, that's a very liberal system of education that we have in place. 
um, and students can create their own degree. So if you want to pursue a career track degree, but at the same time you want to pursue that, that pursue something that you're passionate about, you know, whether it's political science or philosophy or something, you can still do that while you're doing, let's say a bachelor of commerce in accounting, right? So there is that option. You can always, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. Now, the other thing is we have our, our class sizes are small. So let's say in a first year class, you have maybe about 100 to 150 students. But as you go towards, you know, uh, second, third, fourth year, the classes keep getting smaller because you start specializing. And uh, 17, uh, 17 students with one faculty member. So that makes way for a lot of uh, two-way interaction in the classroom. There's a lot of classroom discussion. There's a lot of, uh, you know, you can critique your, your professor. You can have an open debate in your class. Uh, so there's a lot, it's a very democratic environment and there's a lot of discussion that happens in the classroom. So ideally the kind of students, you know, the extroverted students who like to interact a lot or who like to discuss ideas or who like to, to you know, disagree with ideas or question anything that uh, you know question basically a curious mindset so a curious mindset is some is a mindset that would ex excel in our classes right smaller classes a lot of interaction a lot of two-way interaction a lot of a uh, lot of engagement so now this is something which i never got in my time at university i've never been in a class with less than 40 students so this is this is pretty amazing what we have here at mount allison because you can you know, you can interact more. It's, it's a less intimidating environment. Now, I remember in a first year class, I had about 300 students in a first year class. And there were times when I would hesitate to put my hand up and ask a question. Uh, but here, given our smaller class sizes, that wouldn't be difficult. So it's a more open environment, a more welcoming environment for students. 96% of our faculty have, a, uh, have the highest degree in their field. So whether it's a PhD or a master's, they have the highest uh, qualification in their field. We have uh, a very active and a lively campus where there are more than 160 clubs on campus. So clubs and societies, whether you're into debating or you're into hiking or you're into rugby, um, there's a club for pretty much everything that you want to do. So you have a life outside campus and you can really engage your, uh, you have a life outside classes, sorry. And you can really engage yourself in the campus after hours once your classes are over by engaging in these extracurricular activities and clubs that we have. We also have a lot of sports. So we have two gyms on campus. We have uh, a lot of intramural and as well as extramural sports. So we have rugby, we've got hockey, we've got uh, soccer, we've got badminton, we've got volleyball. So pretty much everything that a university has to offer, uh, we have as well. And, you know, so we have, we are a small institution of 2,300 students, but we have all the facilities that let's say an institute, a mid-sized institution where 15,000 students would be offering, right? We are located in a classic university town. Uh, with many cultural offerings. So Sackville is a university town. Sackville is on the east coast of Canada. It's in New Brunswick. And the, it's a smallish town, 5,000 people. And when you say Sackville, it's pretty much synonymous with Mount Allison University because Mount Allison is one of the main aspects about the town. So, and it's a very historic town, a lot of, lot of culture. It's a, you know, like... They, they're very, uh, there's a very strong sense of community. So it's one of the few towns where they encourage, for example, local businesses, right? You, you don't find any chains in Sackville. So they, you know, you don't find any uh, large grocery chains. So they, they encourage local businesses so that, um, you know, the businesses within the community can prosper. Because let's say when you have a Walmart coming in or, uh, you know, um, uh, Costco or something coming in that, that poses a sort of a threat to local businesses. So here, the idea is to promote local business and, you know, promote businesses, promote entrepreneurial ventures that exist within the community or that spring up within the community, which is, which is something that's pretty remarkable. Now we have a lot of, uh, one thing we are known for is we've produced a lot of Oxford scholars. So the Oxford scholarship is basically the Rhodes scholarship where students go on to do their graduate their postgraduate studies at uh, Oxford on a scholarship. And we have produced the most number of Rhodes Scholars or the highest per capita of Rhodes Scholars in Canada. So to date, we produced about 55 Rhodes Scholars, 
which is more than a lot of bigger universities have produced, right? So uh, that just speaks to our academic quality and the, and the academic rigor of our programs. We are also one of Canada's best endowed institutions. So we receive a lot of funding from our alumni. Uh, the, alumni has a, ha, the alumni community has a way, very strong uh, sense of belonging and a bond to the institution. So they like to give back to the university. So we have a lot of, that's why we, uh, you know, because of the funding we receive, be it from alumni or be it from the province or be it from, our, from donors, we, we give out a lot of scholarships. So what we, what we receive, we also do give out uh, in the sense that 78% of our incoming class receives some kind of scholarship or the other. 78% of our incoming class every September, right? Um, I'll move to the next slide. Now this slide talks about our ranking. We've been ranked number one for 21 times in the last 29 years. And recently in the last uh, five years or so, we've never been ranked below number two. So that's a very, very impressive ranking. Uh, and McLe th this ranking is done by McLean's each year. And in the undergraduate category university, we've been ranked number one more times than any other university has. Um, some reasons for this is of course the smaller class size, the ability to structure your own degree as, you know, based on your aspirations, based on what you want to do. So you, for example, as I said earlier, if, just, if you want to pursue a career track degree, but you want to also want to pursue something that you're passionate about, you can do that at Mount Allison. And McLean's is our largest national uh, current affairs publication. So for example, in the US, you've got Time Magazine. In, in India, you've got uh, Outlook or India Today. In Canada, we have McLean's. And each year they do a ranking of universities under various different categories. And so we are an undergraduate university and therefore we've been ranked um, number one in the undergraduate university category. Apart from our university ranking, our overall university ranking, we've also been ranked in 2018 for being number one in terms of awards won by faculty nationally. So that's, that's another great ranking. And now, as I said, our faculty, some things to note about our faculty is that 96% of them have the highest education in their field. And we also have the most number of faculty awards. This was two years ago, right? So now in terms of our history, as I said, we, we were established in 1839. We are located on the Tantramar marshes. Uh, which is basically a very greenish area, a very, uh, you know, there's a lot of greenery around uh, in the heart of a small town called Sackville, New Brunswick. And we were the first university in the entire British Empire to grant a bachelor of uh, bachelor baccalaureate to a woman. Her name was Grace Annie Lockhart. We were also the first university in Canada to grant a bachelor of science degree to a woman. And there are other things like, you know, the person who, uh, who created the Canadian flag, started the Department of Canadian Studies at Mount Allison University. Now, five degrees, 40 programs, as I said earlier. So there's that ability to mix and match. You don't have to stick to your own faculty. You can, if you have an interest from another faculty, you can pursue that. You can, uh, and there's, of course, the, uh, you can do a double major or, you know, uh, or a double degree as well, which can take you about five years. Now, one thing I'll tell you, we have a unique program. It's a special program called, uh, which is in aviation. So we have a partnership with the Moncton Flight College. So students can do a Bachelor of Commerce or a Bachelor of Science uh, in the aviation track. Where what this means is that they can do this. They do a Bachelor of Science um, with a specialization or let's say a track in aviation where they not only get a Bachelor of Science, but they also get the commercial pilot license. So this is one of our unique programs and one of the only programs of its kinds in Canada, where you do a degree, a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Commerce, along with the commercial pilot license. So it's gonna be, now it's four years, so you don't have to add an extra year. I mean, students can finish the degree in four years, as well as you have, uh, the partnership is with Moncton Flight College. So Moncton is a town about 30 minutes away. And it's where, so I, for example, live in Moncton and my, and the campus is in Sackville. So students in the first year, they study on campus, the Bachelor of Science or the Bachelor of Commerce, the general program. Second and third year, they, 
they, uh, they do a blended format where they're doing classes on campus as well as their flight training hours at the Moncton Flight College. And then at the fourth year, they're back to campus finally to finish their uh, last year, right, full time. Now, a student is never directly admitted into a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Commerce in Aviation. They first start in the Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Commerce. They finish, the, they have to meet certain requirements such as passing a health test or a, and as well as a verbal language test. And once they meet those requirements, then in the second year, they can start at the Mountain Flight College. So uh, it's, a very, it's a great program. And uh, I would suggest you look up our website as well as the Mountain Flight College website so you can find information on this program. Um, these are some of our majors. So we have minors, but I haven't listed our minors, but they're all available on our website. So our majors are, for example, under arts, you've got Canadian studies, classics, drama, you know, history, international relations, psychology. Under commerce, you'll see accounting, business administration, business management, finance, marketing, aviation. Under science, again, you'll, you'll see aviation, biology, chemistry, uh, biochemistry. So these are some of our majors. And then we also have minors. Uh, now, the minors are all listed on our website, so you'll be able to find this information there. If you just go mta.ca backslash programs, you'll see all our uh, majors and minors together listed there. Another thing that we have is experiential learning. Now, a lot of universities say we have co-op, but co-op is rather restrictive, right? In the sense that it only has, um, it's mainly a paid internship, a credit-bearing paid internship. Now. To be more, you know, to, to be broader, what we have is experiential learning. So our experiential learning office has been active for the last two or three years, and we have been very successful in getting our students internships. So a co-op office is just for internship, but our experiential learning office includes internships, as well as other things that a student may, might want to pursue. For example, if a student wants to do, uh, let's say, consulting projects or research or go on exchange, you know, uh, an exchange or go attend a conference, right? So all of that our experiential learning office can facilitate. So um, apart from the internship, one way, you know, another unique thing is that students get to do consulting projects. If a student is interested in entrepreneurship, let's say he has a, he wants to develop, he or she wants to develop an app or he or she wants to develop a, let's say a catering venture, a food catering venture. Uh, experiential learning office can enable and assist in the development of that venture. So rather than saying co-op, which is, which is rather restrictive, here we have experiential learning, which is basically applied learning that can include in internships, that can include entrepreneurial ventures, that can include consulting, that can include research, that can include conferences. So it's more inclusive. It's, more, it's, more, it's a much broader uh, form of applied learning that we have in our programs. Now, as I said, 17 students and one uh, faculty that now we are also very well known for undergraduate research opportunities, right? So our Bachelor of Science program, uh, very, very strong for research. And you can do regardless of the specialization or the track you decide to pursue, you can uh, partake in research activities. This is another video. This is just about, uh, you know, uh, one of our unique aspects, our most I wanted to go to a university that was unique to me, a university where when I go there, I'm not just a person in a chair. I wanted to know my professors. If I see them walking around campus, stop them and ask them a question. And that's what we get at Mount A. Sometimes we have classes of about six people, which is really small, but also um, you get to know your colleagues really well and you get to work with them even outside of class and really grow as a family and as a classroom, which is really nice. Yeah, it makes us not afraid to ask for help when we need it. They're taking the time to reach out to you, helping you when you need extra assignments. You have these internships where you can work with your professors. So that's something that you actually have an opportunity to do when you come to a small university, and that's why I love Mount A.
There is nothing like being in a class with a handful of students. Uh, I relish the opportunity to work with my classes where there are just five, 10, uh, 15 individuals. The opportunity to create relationships not only with your professors, but also with your peers, to be seen to be part, to be a member of a community, a learning community. It's common to have small class sizes, anywhere from 10 to 20 students. And you're able to um, take on projects at a much different scope than you can in larger class size. And this really helps you to um, understand what the students' interests are and where their, their abilities may be. When you're at the small university, they pick out your strong points. You have professors, they see you, they see what you excel at, and they help you with that, and they help you blossom into the student that you want to be. So that's the town of Sackville, which you can see right here. Um, it's very, very pretty. It's very picturesque. And the best thing, one of the best things about the town is now, I've, I'm, I'm new here, so I'm new to the town, but in my office, in the admissions office, um, I think more than 95% of the staff that works in the admissions office have studied at Mount Allison. And they're all recent graduates, right? So when they go out into, let's say, a restaurant, I, you know, I accompany them, sometimes they go out for lunch to a restaurant. I see them, you know, every time I walk with them, so the restaurant, maybe the downtown restaurant, some a 10 minute walk away or a five to 10 minute walk away. And every time they're walking around the town, they're saying hi to at least three or four people and stopping to have conversations with them, right? So, which is pretty remarkable because, I mean, having lived in big cities myself, having lived in Delhi, Dubai, Vancouver, I've, this is something pretty phenomenal, which I find because uh, you know, this, the, the ease of making friends, uh, you know, and these, these people have all been working at the university and the way they interact with everybody, the, you know, the, it's so easy to, to start a conversation with anybody. Uh, and invariably, when you're walking around, you'll meet people that, and, that you recognize and you'll say hello to. So as an international student, you know, when you go into a new country and you do need to settle down in a new place, uh, it's a much less intimidating environment. So you'll find people that are very friendly, that are out there to help you, that, you know, that you can always reach out. And that's one of the best parts. That's one of the best things that I uh, find as an outsider about Sackville and about our university, right? So it is, it's pretty phenomenal. And I could, I mean, I wasn't fortunate to study at Mount Allison, but if I could do, if I could probably rewind back 15 years, I would have chosen a institution, a smaller institution where I can do a bachelor's degree. And, you know, I, now I left home at the age of 17. Um, my first time I went abroad, the first time I boarded a flight to, to go overseas. Um, and I landed up in a mid-sized university, a big town. A, you know, it was a proper city and I didn't know anyone there. So, and it took me a good year, maybe at least the first six months I was kind of homesick, but I've not seen that with any students that are here. So even students, let, let's say, come in January, you know, during, let's say in the winter semester, I join in Jan and I meet some of these students, they're very, they're very much at ease now and they've all already transitioned into the community, transitioned into the university and they're quite at ease and they're quite comfortable. So that just, that just speaks a lot about, you know, the, um, the, as an international student to settle in, it's always better to go to a smaller town as opposed to a very big city um, where, you know, you will be, you're pretty much on your own or a big university. Like, for example, there are some universities in Canada, Canada which have about 75,000 students. So, I mean, the faculty is not going to know you in your first two years at least. So the, the, those are some aspects which are really advantages, of, advantages about a smaller university in a smaller community. Now, this is exactly where we are. So, uh, Sackville is just about, I live in Moncton, and it's a 20-minute drive southeast of Moncton, right? 20 to 30 minutes, you're southeast of Moncton. In the winters, yeah, it can take about 35 minutes if it's snowing, but generally 20 to 30 minutes, you're on campus. Uh, we are a two-hour flight away from Toronto, and likewise, perhaps a two-hour flight away from New York. The closest airport is in Moncton. And that's where the Moncton Flight College also is. 
And Sackville, as I said, is a 20 to 30 minute drive uh, southeast of Moncton, just by the Nova Scotia border, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia border. Now this area, there's some great aspects about this area, the, you know, the east, the maritime provinces in general. So Eastern Canada or the maritime provinces, firstly, the cost of living is excellent. Uh, you know, you may, the salaries are consistent. Like for example, if you work for a bank of, uh, like Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, whether you're working in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Vancouver, or in Moncton, let's say, or in Sackville, you know, as you're working, let's say, as a personal banking advisor or something, you start out after doing a degree in personal banking. That's just one of the career, one example I'm giving you. The salary would be the same, regardless of where you go in Canada, but the cost of living would be uh, phenomenally lower in uh, in this part of Canada. So, like, just my example, I was before this, I was living in Vancouver, and I was paying. What I was paying for a one bedroom, unfurnished apartment. It wasn't even a one bedroom, it was like a studio. And for the same amount, I've got a three bedroom, fully furnished house, right, in Moncton. Um, and that's, that's, so there's some, so, you know, cost of living is excellent. And therefore, even for students, our university halls of residence are very, very affordable as compared to other universities. The cost of living is lower. Um, we have a lot of opportunities in terms of part-time jobs and internships. So Moncton is, uh, you know, the town which is about 30 minutes away where I live, 30 minutes away from Sackville. Now this town has been ranked as the best town in, Can like the best city in Canada to find a job. Bank of Montreal in 2018, they came up with a ranking and they said Moncton is the best city in Canada to find a job in. So, you know, for this re entire region, southeastern New Brunswick. So for students that are looking, let's say, for internships or part-time jobs, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, they generally do manage to find it. Of course, they have to go through the entire interview process and do their own diligence as well. But generally, a student that is motivated, ambitious, they all manage to find something, right? So that's, that's one aspect. Uh, the, the cost of living, the opportunity, and the third thing is, we have we are part of the Atlantic immigration program. So, for example, international students can take advantage of the provincial nominee program, which is basically the Atlantic immigration program, and they have the opportunity to apply for residency um, after they finish their degree. And I, I believe it's a faster track process. So I'm not fully familiar with it, but you must Google the Atlantic immigration program and have a look at that. So. That's that's the third aspect. The last aspect I would say is the out, you know, just the region in general. There's a lot of outdoor activities that students can engage themselves in. So, for example, Sackville is not far away from the beach. I think in an hour you're at the beach. In winters, if you want to go skiing, that's also an hour away. So there's something for every season, you know. And there's there's plenty of plenty to do outdoors. Um, and to be to be just a few hours away from. Uh, Cape Breton, which is in Nova Scotia, and Cape Breton has one of the most scenic drives in the world. So it's like it's somewhat similar to the Great Ocean Road that you have in Australia, where it's a parallel road that runs along the ocean, and it's one of the most scenic drives. So it's a very, very beautiful part of Canada. It's a very beautiful part of the North American continent to actually be studying in and to spend four years in. So this is our campus. I haven't been fortunate enough to see this campus right now. I joined in Jan when there was a lot of snow uh, and like all the rest of Canada, even we receive our fair share of snow. Uh, but right now uh, we are looking forward to campus opening and you know, right now we're all working from home as you all are. Um, and when hopefully by the end of next month, they should, uh, you know, if we do announce a staggered opening, I look forward to seeing this, you know, some of this that I haven't had a chance to see before. Now we have eight residences on campus, right? We have some residences on the north side and some on the south side. 90% of our first year students that come, now remember we are a small town of 5,000 people. So therefore uh, students must be ready to be living on campus. You know, they may not find something, they may not find off campus accommodation as soon as they arrive. So 90% of our incoming students do live on campus in the first year. And then they make their friends and perhaps after second or, third, you know, after first or second year, they start looking for off-campus housing options. 
and they all move in together, you know, like maybe a couple of uh, students take a house together. So that is, uh, now our residences, uh, we have different, like let's say if, if it's a female student who wants to, who's, you know, like um, who wants, if let's say looking for single gender floors or uh, that is also available. So we have single gender floors. Um, if your student is not comfortable with mixed living, that is also an option. Now we also have meal plans, right? So students living on campus can take advantage of the meal plan where they have unlimited meal plans for a fixed cost. So I'll go over those costs with you. So speaking again, just to, uh, touching upon our clubs and societies once again. So these are all our 110, uh, you know, like all our clubs. So we've got swimming, we've got hockey, we've got, uh, you know, debating, we've got, uh, you know, sound production and music, hiking, kayaking, a lot of things to do. Um, if you're interested, we also do performance arts, if you're interested in volunteering. So some stuff that you can do outside of our class hours. Now, in terms of admission requirements, we have a lot of different requirements, uh, you know, because we have a lot of different international students that come in. So every curriculum has its own specification and you will be able to find this information on the mta.ca backslash requirements page. So you can put in, you know, that, okay, I'm an international student. I'm from uh, Nepal. I am um, currently in high school. And then it'll, and then you click on go and it'll give you all the requirements from Nepal, let's say for a high school student, right? So, and likewise, if you say I'm a transfer student, I'm in second or third year, then you choose that I'm a transfer student, right? So it'll give you that, okay, these are the requirements you need to meet. So all our admission requirements, I would advise you to refer to that page because that'll give you real time specific admission requirements uh, for each curriculum or country that the student is studying in. Now, in terms of English, what we require is most students generally do an IELTS. Uh, uh, IELTS is six and a half with no band score less than six. We are also accept the Duolingo. Duolingo uh, English test is accepted because right now, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are taking Duolingo like with all other universities. Um, uh, the minimum score that we require is 110. And a student who decides to do TOEFL, for 580 is the score for the paper test, 213 computer tests, and 90 internet-based tests. Now, for example, if a student uh, cannot get into, he cannot, he or she cannot get into the direct program because our direct program requirement is six and a half with no band score less than six. So if they met the high school requirements, but let's say they, instead of six and a half and six, they got six with 5.5, they can come and do our they can start with the EAB program. That's not an additional time spent. So you're not studying three months of English and then four years of degree. It's you, so basically the, when you start your program, it can be, let's say, uh, uh, let's say roughly three months. That's the maximum on a higher end. You will be studying three months of English parallelly while pursuing your degree. So it doesn't add three months extra. You can study that along with English, uh, along with your classes and these English courses, that English preparation that you do on the side, which is the English academic bridging program is of course non-credit bearing, but you can pursue that along with your degree. So you don't spend additional time. But for that also, we have a requirement that the band score should not be less than 5.5 in any single band and overall can be six, right? Now, so that's, and if a student does not have that or does not want to do an IELTS, then we have other English language partners like in Toronto and Halifax, where students can study, you know, their, the prescribed partners, English language program, pass it, and we will consider that equivalent to an IELTS, right? Uh, to meeting the English requirement, basically. Now, this is our fees. So $18,000 is our fees. For the aviation program, remember, because they are doing the second and third year, at the Moncton Flight College. So there's a different fees. So that's around, in the, for second and third year, it becomes around $33,000, right? For second and third year, instead of 18, because you're paying uh, university, uh, the university, as well as the Moncton Flight College has their own tuition fee. But for all other programs, it's 18,000 approximately. And then on-campus residence and un the unlimited meal plan is about $10,000 together. 
Uh, there's the student organization fees, which is 800. Now, this is basic medical insurance of 710, but if a student is looking for, let's say, dental and other add-ons, it can go up $1,000. There's other fees, there's textbooks. The total a student is looking at about, let's say $33,000 a year. Uh, living, studying, all inclusive. Now, our expectations of agencies, what we want is that uh, firstly, uh, every application should be made online. Uh, we charge a $50 application fee and students can apply through our portal. So mta.ca backslash apply. And what we want is that students must upload all their documents. You know, so it'll tell you, for example, as you start the application, you say, okay, I'm a high school student in final year of high school. It'll tell you, okay, these are the documents that you need to upload. If a student clicks, yes, I am using the services of an agency in, uh, in submitting my application, it'll also tell you what additional documents are required. So, so it'll keep giving you those prompts about the documents required. So for example, student is applying through an agency, it'll say that, okay, this particular form, uh, the agent consent form must be printed, signed and scanned. So, and then you print the form out, it'll give you the form on the portal. You just print it out, sign it, scan it. So um, just follow the prompts and just make sure that every document as far as possible is being provided and uploaded online, right? Because when we see, when we, when I receive an application and I see everything is there, I'll likely, I'll process that application the quickest. But when I see an application, okay, two documents are missing, I'll put it back into the pending queue, right? And then uh, it goes back into queue. So it's best that if everything is there, then there's no reason for it to go back into queue, no reason for me to get back to you and ask you for those additional documents so just make sure it's as complete as possible. And the more documentation you submit, the better it is. Now, for example, if a student is a mature student, he says my date of birth is 1991. So that means he's obviously over, uh, he's over 22 years old. Uh, or let's say he's like 1985 or whatever. If he's, if he's over 22 years old, it will ask you for some additional documents like a letter of intent, a resume. So those also must be uploaded. So just continue following the prompts, whatever the system tells you and the agent consent form must be there. So, so that in case we have any questions, we can always, you know, um, if, if you want to ask me questions on about the student's application, I can give you a response because that form is already uploaded. Right. So I know that, okay, you have the consent to receive information about that particular student. Our timeline is about two to four weeks, but in busy periods, like, you know, especially February to April, it can go up to eight business weeks. So just make sure that you submit all your documents so that, uh, because in a busy period, it'll go back into the pending queue and then you'll have to wait for, you know, uh, you'll have to, there'll be an additional waiting period then. So also sometimes if you have additional documents, like uh, if, you know, you can always email it to admissions at mta.ca. Now, that's at the end of my presentation, but if you do have any more questions, you can always reach out to global at mta.ca, right? I'll leave it open to questions now, and uh, Shivani, I'll let you take over and direct any questions that you want towards me. Right, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your personal experience with our audience and me, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, so we have a few questions. Um, uh, the attendees want to know that how many hours a week a student will be studying? Okay, so generally you're spending um, at least, let's say you're doing, um, you know, for the number of courses you're doing. So if you're doing an average of four or five courses, let's say five courses, you can be spending at least three hours of lecture time in each course. So two lectures a week and at least uh, 90 minutes of lecture time each time. So that's about three hours. So multiply that. Now, most of our classes, so we try to give, you know, so at least four days you'll be fairly booked with classes. And if you generally Fridays is we try to keep it lighter, but if you, that's if you book your, if you, uh, enroll in your classes well in time, you can sort of choose your own timetable. You know, you can create your own time, 
timetable. But if you enroll right at the last minute, you may have some Friday classes as well, you know, like one or two hours on Friday. But generally it's, uh, yeah, I would say the number of courses multiplied by 90 minutes, uh, so at least three hours of lecture time per, per class, per course. Right. Thank you. The another question is uh, how, what is the method of study at MTA? What methods do you have? So it's everything. So for example, like uh, there's some courses which are, firstly, it's, a, it's, there's, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of discussion that happens in the classroom. So I'm guessing I haven't studied here, but I presume, and I am quite certain that for class engagement as well, I, <laughs> It would be there would be a score for class engagement. Uh, a lot of fo focus would be there on internal examinations on uh, sorry on internal assessments like group presentations, assignments, uh, individual presentations, individual uh, assignments. You know, you, so for every every subject that you're doing each semester, you will have something or the other due each week for that particular subject. Whether it's you know so whether it's a group presentation or whether it's a class test or whether it's an individual essay, there will be something due for every course per week. So your internal uh, assessments will make up a significant percent of it. And then we have right. exams as well, end of semester exams, but it's not just the exams, which is hundred percent. So uh, it depends course to course. There can be some courses where, you know, where, uh, which are 100% internally, you know, just weekly, uh, weekly submissions, or there's some which may be a mix of 60, 40, or 50, 50, you know, so it varies. Uh, a blend of, you know, different methods. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, there's a question uh, that they're asking, what are the job opportunities after completion of the programs at MTA? There are plenty of uh, jobs, so it depends. Now we are, uh, we traditionally started out as a liberal arts and sciences institution. So liberal arts, so basically liberal education. And when you say liberal, now we are not, you know, we, we don't say, okay, you have to do, um, you know, BCom means commerce, right? You can choose, you can do a BCom in accounting, but you might be wanting to do some classes from music and as well as some classes from the faculty of arts and philosophy. Right. So it's a way what we what we coach our students in and what we are known for is our students are uh, very vocal. They speak, they, they talk a lot, right? Like they, they uh, interact a lot. They, they critique you a lot and they disagree a lot. Right. So they have their own they're, they're very strong opinions. So which is actually very good. And it's a very curious mindset because most of the so essentially a make or break factor in any job application is the interview. And that is where our students can excel because they've come from small classes where they've been talking, 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 talking for the last four years. And when you can speak your way through an interview and you can impress and you can, you know, you have, uh, you can give, actually give, give some good feedback, some good answers. You can ask the right questions to somebody who's interviewing you. Um, that is, I think the make or break factor and that is where our students really excel. So even, you know, like for example, the Rhodes scholarship also does have an interview process, the Oxford scholarship. So our students, and because of, because us, we actually have produced the most number of Rhodes scholars of any institution in Canada per capita. So that just speaks to the caliber of the graduates that we produce, right? So the ones who can um, like, tackle that Rhodes Scholarship interview as in addition to the academics. Likewise, the same thing applies to jobs as well. So when you're looking for a job, um, the uh, interviewer obviously wants to see how engaged you are, how, how capable you are of delivering and how, uh, you know, the content of your discussion. So that is where our students excel. So throughout the study, they have been nourished that way that they can excel after completion of their studies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. So, so yeah. there are students who come here as introverts, right? Uh, I know some students in my own admissions team who say they were introverts. Uh, I mean, now they're not students anymore. They're working with me, but, and they were also international students. So this, uh, this, I mean, the, the institution basically makes you blossom. 
right? So uh, if you're an introvert, by the time you leave, there's a good likelihood that you'll be a total extrovert. Right, true. So um, you have almost answered the next question. Uh, there was a question where if the students can get on-campus job, as you mentioned that uh, since few of the graduates are already working, so there is an opportunity to work on the campus for students. Yeah, yeah. there are plenty of things you can do on campus. Um, there are jobs on campus, you know, you can work as a laboratory assistant if you or you can work as a, uh, in the, uh, you know, in the library, or you can work as a teaching assistant, or you can work somewhere on like, you know, in the university um, as a cashier somewhere on campus or in the gym, or there are plenty of things you can do on campus. So there are students who work on campus. Uh, there are students who choose to work off campus also. They may want to work in fast food or they may want to work with the city of or the town of Sackville. Um, so there are plenty of things that students can do. Then there are some students who decide to buy a car in their second, third year and they maybe, you know, they work in Moncton. They come to do their internship in Moncton. So for example, uh, we have, I met this student recently who is, who our experiential learning office actually helps. She wants to do law. Now, as you know, in Canada, law is taught at the graduate level. So you do a bachelor's degree and then you challenge uh, the law exam. After that, you apply to law schools, right? So now she's a BA student and she, her aspiration is to do law. So uh, in experiential learning office helped arrange an internship with a law firm uh, where she's working currently as a, I think, a, in the capacity of a legal assistant. And so it's just giving her, you know, that exposure to a law firm. So, yeah, if you, I mean, there are, there are Southeast New Brunswick, there are plenty of things that a student can actually do in terms of opportunities, in terms of part-time jobs, whether it's off campus or on campus. Right. Thank you for answering that. Um, there are certain questions that are popping in that how much gap will be accepted after a grade 12? Uh, now, we do accept gap, right? But it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that a student, let's say, has been sitting idle for more than 12 months. Right? Okay, he, uh, he or she did high school and then after that decided to volunteer. That's fine. Or decided to work in the father's business. Fine. Or decided to, uh, you know, just uh, travel or like as long as they were gainfully doing something, you know, volunteering or working or uh, maybe ch uh, preparing for some competitive exams, which they did not clear. That's still okay. It's acceptable. But let's say they, if they now if they've already started a bachelor's degree, uh, let's say start any kind of post-secondary education after they finished high school, then they have to declare those grades. They have to state that yes, we have. Uh, even if they don't get credit transfers, but you know, we need to know that. Right. They get some credit transfers. You never know. They may be um, granted some uh, credits for what they've already studied. But yeah, and if they've just done like three or four months, we still need to know that. Um, yeah, so they should be as uh, transparent, as honest as possible on the application, of course. Certainly. So um, in idle uh, language, a two to three years would be accepted if they have some documented proof with them, if they were appearing for examination and other things. So up to two or two years, is that okay? That's a little long. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, because if you're preparing for an exam, I guess you take generally one year. So yeah. up to two months, yes, that should be fine. But more than 12 months, we, I'm not saying no, we, we will just uh, need to know more in that case. We'll, okay. need, we'll get back to you. We'll need to maybe speak to the student, what, you know, get a clearer idea. Right, right. Um, Adhiraj, oh, there's a question, which all boards are accepted at MTA? What education boards are accepted? We just won't take that 10 plus in uh, some places have a 10 plus three diploma or I don't know what that is. A 10 plus uh, it's a polytechnic diploma. Yeah. Yeah. So that one, it's uh, no. So that one and uh, the national open Indian NIOS. So these two boards are not accepted, but CBSC, ICSC state board, a level IB. These are the ones we'll accept. If it's a general, like I'm, you're, you're asking about which country? India, I'm, I suppose? Yes. Primarily okay. India, yeah. yes. Yeah, so uh, these are the boards that we will accept. 
the state boards would be accepted only private boards open boards will not be accepted and, and in case board, student and just open board 10th class 3 Yes. So a student who yes, uh, I think it, the call. I mean, the voice got dropped. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was asking if the student has done grade tenth, grade twelfth, and then a diploma, a polytechnic diploma, that would be accepted, right? As long as they're doing their grade twelfth. Yeah, that should be fine. So grade ten, and they've done their grade twelfth. They've done a polytech diploma. Yes, that should be okay. Right, right, Adhiraj. Adhiraj, uh, would you like to one tell? Thing, I'll just clarify. I'll sure. just clarify one thing. Sure. Even though he's done that diploma, he or she has done that diploma. Hmm. The we have a requirements from India from high school mentioned on our website. Right. It's not okay if they've done that diploma. We will not look at the high school grades. The high school will be a first priority. because that's what we want for admission into the university then if if the student is successfully gotten into the like if the student is admissible is admissible on the basis of high school grades then we will consider what additional things he has done for a credit transfer but just because he has uh, he or she has that 10 plus like 12 plus 2 diploma did very well in the diploma but didn't do well in high school uh, that may not that generally won't work we want a good uh, we want the minimum high school requirement also met right and uh, we know that we are offering bachelors to india market currently so but there will be students who uh, want to take up another bachelors or who are are appearing for their graduation like you said that you would need uh, you know the documentation for that so if they have some backlogs in that they, if they have reappears so how much that will be accepted or if that going to affect their application So you're saying a student already doing a bachelor's degree and wants to come to us to do another bachelor's? Yes, in that also, and in case they are dropping out, will those scores matter or those reappears will matter uh, in their admissions? If yes, then how many backlogs there should be ideally for for an exception? Uh, I, that I don't have an answer to that question because I don't receive those kind of applications, right? Right. Uh, I, uh, I don't receive students. I just receive maybe. i've seen students with one year maybe 14 months or so of yeah of post secondary education not more than that so and uh, you know so yeah so i i don't have an answer to that right now right uh, yeah we'll we we'll can get back to them on that yeah. right um, so ours is, an, ours is a undergraduate university right uh, it's basically for students who are looking to do bachelor's degree so i don't you know like we don't have too many students who are well into their third year or something or yeah plus years and then looking you know uh, unless yeah so i i don't have too many of those cases but yeah there are some students like let's say from the us or some other places which i don't take care of so those regions yeah we do have students applying for credit transfers and we can even consider credit transfers but generally it's just that i have not seen a transcript with you know two and a half years of bachelor's degree done in india right all right um uh, there's a question they want to know what what will the september intake be online or hybrid how does that going to work so i'll show you a quick video on that one um it's a 5 minute video so if you yeah i'll just show yeah that. yes If you follow our Facebook page you'll find this video there as well. Right? Uh talks about Paul and maybe Jan
So the uh, key goal for developing an academic plan for Mount Allison for the fall was flexibility. Uh, we know there are students who may be able to come to campus. We know there are students who may not be able to come to campus. We know there are students internationally. So we were trying to find a plan that would be as flexible as possible to account for as many needs as possible. The first category of courses are unscheduled courses, and those are courses that are, are listed um, that you can take, but they're not actually timetabled. And this is to allow maximum flexibility. We know there are students, perhaps even in Sackville, who for whatever reasons, either cannot come to campus or cannot maintain a normal schedule. We also have international students that are across many time zones. So we have a bunch of courses that are unscheduled. You can do them at uh, your pace. Now there are deadlines often associated with those courses, for things like when assignments are due and so on. But overall, they're flexible. For the scheduled courses, they do appear in the timetable and they do occur on a given date and time. Now, every course here this year will have online components. That's just the reality of maintaining physical distancing, having fewer people in rooms, having less contact. So for those scheduled courses, there will be online content and then there will either be courses that are completely um, online, so they'll be delivered via video link or other technologies, and then there will be courses that have on-campus elements, so those could be labs. So if you're a science student, that could be a chemistry lab. If you're a fine arts student, uh, that could be a studio where you're doing printmaking or you're doing uh, sculpture or something like that. Music student, uh, you may be having private lessons. Um, so there will be a variety of on-campus elements that are being developed by our faculty for, for the fall. Right now for the winter term at Mount Allison, we're continuing to plan as if it will be as normal as possible. Um, all classes will be on campus. All labs and studios will be on campus. We may well have some online courses as well, just to provide flexibility. We may still have some international students who are not able to get here even for the winter term. We're conscious of that, so we'll have plans for those students. Now, obviously, like all universities in Canada, we're continuing to monitor our plans on a weekly basis. And if if things change, well then we'll have to adapt and we'll have to change. For our returning students, I think the key message is we've got all summer to prepare. We know that the end to the winter term was a tough uh, go for everyone involved, for faculty, for students. Um, we'll be much better prepared in the fall and you'll be better prepared as students. You'll have a better idea of what's uh, going to happen. You also have the benefit of knowing your faculty and your faculty know you. That will make it a little less complicated to go to school in the fall. For new students who are going to be coming to Mount Allison, this will be a different experience. We know that many of you didn't even get the opportunity to finish your high school experience in a, a normal way. Um, so we're going to take extra time and care with our orientation this year to help you know how to go to school and be successful in the world that we will all be collectively living uh, this fall. Students can certainly get help with their registration. We have academic advisors, as we've always had. Um, most students at this time of year have contacted those advisors by phone call or email anyway. Um, now those advisors are very used to using video, so we may actually have better opportunities to connect with students around academic advising. In terms of the supports that we're going to have during the academic year, again, they'll be a little bit different in the sense that some of them may have to be done by video or remote communication, but we'll have our wellness center running, we'll have our MEAN center running, we'll have more services than ever for students to help them deal with the complexities of going to school this fall. So we've been asked a lot of questions about how faculty will be participating in online courses and there really is no single answer because it depends on the year level, it depends on the discipline, it depends on how big the courses are. We're going to be hiring a lot of students as academic mentors so they'll be helping faculty. We certainly hope that faculty will be able to connect directly with students in all courses and in all situations. Now in some situations that may be a little bit more challenging so it may be that you have other kinds of academic staff um, technicians and so on who are contacting you about your courses. I just want to say that we're focusing a lot on the fall of 2021 and that may seem strange but what we're trying to do is think about how we can give you academic programming that will allow you to be back on track in the fall of 2021. So even if you have to take online courses during both the fall and winter terms, this coming academic year, we'll also have a robust spring summer term in 2021. Students will be able to take additional courses, including some lab courses that we'll be offering in order to get back on track so that they arrive at the same point as their peers in the fall of 2021.
surprised that Raj, thank you for sharing that video. It was very uh, informative. And uh, since you're running out of time now for the presentation, so you know, I would like to thank you and the audience for such an informative session. And uh, before we close down, do you would like to say anything to the attendees? Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all for hearing me out. Uh, you, I, yeah, we've gone a little over time, but I'll just say a few things in closing. Uh, ours is an undergraduate institution, right? So, and generally we, we look for, now when you're referring a student to Mount Allison, we look for quality because you've seen our rankings. You have told you about our rankings. I told you about the smaller class size. So, so be cognizant of the fact that, you know, us now, if you're sending this, if you send a student, uh, you should, firstly, they should have a good level of English when they're coming here, right? They should be, uh, they should be adaptable. Now, if a student is looking for a big city experience, he wants to come to Canada, wants to go to, and you know, he's heard, heard of Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and his first preference is Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Uh, you know, those sort of students, they feel free to refer them to Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver universities. But if a student whose motive is academic and they're looking for their, you know, they're looking for a ranked institution. And if you feel that they're bright, they like to, you know, they have a lot of ideas. And when you interact with them, because you're the face, uh, I mean, you're, you, you, you're the front line and you deal with students on a day-to-day -day basis. When you see a student is, is the motive is academic and they're looking for, for an institution which is not very expensive. They're looking for an institution which is highly ranked and they're ambitious, right? They are, you feel they're hardworking, they're humble, and they have a curious mindset and they want to achieve. That's the sort of student that we want, right? So uh, a, a student whose intent is only immigration, a student whose intent is a big city experience, our university may not be the right fit for that student. So I don't want... I, I look for, we want quality over quantity. So the students that you refer to us, make sure they are good, they're capable, and they ha are genuine. They want, they, they, when, so that when they come here, you know, they're not, they don't try to run off to Toronto, Vancouver, right? Uh, they'll actually stay here in uh, adapt, uh, you know, transition into the university and uh, make use of the investment and finish the four years over here. So that's what that's, Quality or quantity and genuine intent is what we look for. Right. Thank you, Adiraj, uh, for such a lovely session. And we are looking forward for more sessions from your end in the coming months. Sure. Right. And I would also like to thank uh, our participants for taking out time and be here with us. And uh, 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 audience can uh, follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and can find our YouTube channel. Uh, follow our YouTube channel as well and the recording will be available there. They can also follow up www.msquaremedia.com for further uh, assistance and thank you everyone for participating today. Thank you Adiraj. Hope to see you soon again. Uh, until then, stay safe, stay home. Right? Thank you so thank much. You. Take thank care. You so much, bye bye. bye.